I think that there is major damage that has been done to the balance sheets of the banking institutions uh, because they had bought long-term debt. As you know, you buy it and then, you know, you basically you take a loss because of what the Federal Reserve's actions were after you purchased it at par. Now you're sitting on, you know, billions of dollars worth of losses. It was then papered over and covered up through uh, the BTFP, the bank term funding program of a little over a year ago where you had all those banks that were blowing up. Anyways, long story short, I think there's a lot of damage that has been done to the banking institutions and to the debt markets that, that the American public isn't privy to. Hey guys, welcome back to Capital Cosm. Today we've got Clint Russell from the Liberty Lockdown podcast on the show. Clint, thank you so much for coming on, my friend. I uh, appreciate it, man. Uh, thank you for the invite. I, my my Twitter is going absolutely ballistic, or X, I guess you should say. Uh, got covered by Fox News <laughs> last wow. night. My my mom and my grandpa are f- freaking out, so uh, I'm having a fun 24 hours. What was it over? Was it over the Olympic uh, opening ceremony? Was that it? Yeah, yeah. The uh, the tweet I put out has almost 25 million views at this point, so it's oh, wow, it's going going nuts but uh yeah trace gallagher said it on on the news <laughs> late night my mom sent it to me like she had discovered cold fusion it was the cutest thing i've ever seen yeah i think that was actually the tweet that i retweeted you on and that's how actually how we connected uh, yeah that's pretty cool yeah so for those who may not know uh you know i, I think it was in regards to the, the the pale horse uh feature in the opening ceremony in the olympics yeah and we can just dive right into it man let's just dive right into it um some really strange um choices for uh, imagery at the Olympics uh, yesterday at the time of this recording. Uh, what do you make of this? Is this PR? Are they just trying to get publicity, trying to get people talking about it? Or, you know, we can get a little conspiratorial. Is there, are they really trying to send like some sort of occultic, satanic message to the broad public? I mean, that's the, right. th- that's the big question, right? W- what's kind of like your take on this? I mean, that's that's the question I think everybody's asking themselves. I, I personally lean towards it just being really intentionally provocative. I mean, the, the French have uh, kind of a history of that uh, in, in recent memory. They actually used to be one of the most religious countries in the world, uh, not so much anymore. And I, I think that you know their creative director for the opening ceremony wanted to be inflammatory. Like, that's... I don't know how to read it any other way than that. Now, now is the inflammatory nature of the production actually indicative of satanism like i don't know <laughs> how could i how could i possibly know if that's actually what what we're witnessing but it was a series of events from the golden calf to the pale horse rider uh you know there's there's additional ones i mean the the uh the last supper where you replace jesus and his disciples with a bunch of men in drag and you also have a child that looks as if they're at the table is like you're you're trying to offend people you're you're attempting to actually irritate and and inflame the situation so i at the end of the day does that mean that they're actually trying to push a a satanic worldview i can't say i'm not sure yeah that's a big sixty four thousand dollar question i'm actually curious to hear from you guys as well comment down below let me know your thoughts on the opening ceremony yeah i mean it was just blatantly um, out there it feels like they were trying to get some sort of reaction they definitely did um yeah. Clint, I, I yeah go ahead no i just said yeah i just laughed i mean it, it it was i think i feel like it was a misstep like i maybe they just didn't expect maybe they thought that it would get some people that notice and some people that that post about it and therefore it'll drive traction because it'll actually like it'll reach people but only in a way that like oh let's oh the olympics are on i forgot you know um but I think it went the other direction where like you have probably, I don't know, 20 million Christian people who are now protesting this thing. Yeah. Uh, so I think it was an, an overstep. Yeah, for sure. Um, we actually stepped over, talk about over an overstep. We actually stepped over your intro. Uh, Clint, this is your maiden voyage on the show. Tell us a little about a little bit about yourself. Who is Clint Russell? Yes. Uh, I, I, well, I guess most recent memory, what I'm known for, I ran for the vice presidency of the United States a few months ago under the Libertarian Party, came up a few delegates short, uh, and we actually run for the vice president and the president. Uh, that's the one weird thing about the Libertarian Party. So that's the unique thing. I came up, I think, 20, 30, 31 delegates short out of about 1,000, so it was very close. Uh, I'm actually relieved that I don't have to do it, uh, but I, I've become 
one of the, I guess, I guess more prominent voices in the libertarian movement over the past few years. I started my show, uh, Liberty Lockdown, in May of 2020. You can obviously tell why I was inspired to do so. Uh, prior to that, I ran a couple hundred million dollar mortgage fund out of California, did that for a decade, and was very, uh, very successful, very happy, playing beach volleyball four days a week and loving life. And then Gavin Newsom tried to ruin my life and, uh, and made me a refugee in the great state of Florida. So that's, that's my story arc. Yeah. You and, um, plenty of others as well. Mm, yep. Um, so tell us about the libertarian party. Who is the nominee of the libertarian party? And there's some, uh, there's some controversy surrounding this person, you know, d does he get your stamp of approval or no? And, and why or why not? Yeah. I mean, Unfortunately, because I, I lost to him, it's going to come across as sour grapes, but it's really not. Uh, had I lost to someone I, I thought represented my beliefs in a way that I could be proud of, I would still be fine uh, you know, endorsing and supporting them loudly. But that's just not the case. Uh, his name is Chase Oliver, and, and you know, I wish him well. I don't, I don't like hate him as a person. I just There's a, a handful of beliefs that he and I don't share that I, I feel really make him not a good representative for our cause. Um, and it actually pains me to say that. I know that sounds weird since I lost to the, to that ticket, but it pains me to say it because I want to be supportive of the libertarians. Uh, but you know, his, his, his take on the, uh, the entire COVID era, the lockdown era era, uh, was, was extraordinarily blue pilled by blue pilled. I mean, totally in lockstep with what the corporate news narrative was and, you know, proudly wearing his mask and taking pictures and proudly getting his boosters and taking the pictures and telling, you know, everybody he knows online to go do the same, um, just came across like naive, unbelievably naive. And if you're running to be the president of the United States, even though the libertarians got very little shot of that actually prevailing, it's vitally important that you're actually able to see through psychological operations in real time. And he couldn't. I, uh, on the inverse of that, I named my show Liberty Lockdown and I knew that we were being led astray very early on. And I'll, I'll, I'll end my rant on that particular topic because we're still not really able to talk about that era openly on this platform without getting us in trouble. Um, and then I'll transition to the transitioning issue in that he has been supportive historically of child transition care, if you want to put it in the politically correct way. And uh, I, I oppose that personally. I believe that children can't consent and that ultimately there is deleterious consequences, very dangerous consequences for allowing kids to, to go down that path. And, and I don't know what I can say on this platform in that regard either. So I'll end that there. Uh, but those, those two topics are the major ones that set us apart and make it so that I cannot support him. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, ability or inability to spot psychological operations, psyops, right? There's so much, um, there, there's so much deception in today's world. Uh, how do you, how, how would you recommend the average person go about trying to discern truth from you know, reality from falsehoods, for example, like what would you, what would kind of be like your, um, your, your prescription for that? Sure. I mean, for, for some people, then they'll, they'll never be capable. So uh, I, I assume your audience is more intelligent than the average person. I, I would, I'm, I'm certain of it to be honest. So uh, I'll, I'll talk to them as opposed to the broader audience who will never be reached. <laughs> I think, I think that, it's really just important that you extrapolate evidence from the past into the future. Like there's this tendency when you see that the FBI or the CIA, or in this case, the FDA or the CDC have been deceitful that you will, you will go, well, historically, yes, sure. JFK, sure. RFK, sure. Martin Luther King. Um, but they would never today. And then all of a sudden you hear a crack and Donald Trump is ducking. And you you have to ask yourself like, well, no, they couldn't. There's no way that they had the hand in that. Impossible. I just think it's important that we extrapolate from prior evidence of corruption, and and your initial assessment ought to be, well, maybe they had something to do with this, and now they have to actually prove their innocence. It's the total inverse of what transfer you know transpires when it comes to an average person who deserves due process and jurisprudence and should always be considered innocent until proven guilty 
I think with the government, when you are actually tasked with keeping a president alive and you fail in such an egregious fashion, the initial assess assessment and assumption ought to be that you were probably in on it. Now, I'm not saying you were, but you got to prove it. <laughs> so I think that's kind of like the more red pill take on things is like once you see that an institution is corrupt, you should you should come out the gate with every new story as I don't know what happened, but I'm not it's not looking good for you guys. Uh, so I think that's that's part of it. And then and then just more broadly, the institutions of of corporate news. I mean, these people have been at best useful idiots and more than likely, you know, paid off propagandists. Why are you still listening to them? Why are you still taking them seriously? Why are you still trusting what they have to say? And I don't. Um, so that's my that's my advice. Yeah, I think you can really boil it down to most people are just not paying attention, right? They're not connecting yeah. the dots. Well, that's that's a big problem, too. Yeah, they're not paying attention. Um, you know, for lack of a better phrase, you know, they tend to have a mem the memory of a goldfish. So right. Things that may have happened a couple of years ago. I mean, take the whole, you know, mandate here. I mean, people right. simply forgotten about the records of what Trump pushed and, and, and all that. I don't want to get into that specifically right now, but uh, it kind of harkens to your point. Because in a court of law, if you're caught lying once, then you can then the entire case is dismissed. Exactly right. right. Yep. So if it's good enough for a court of law, it should be good as a as a model um, for discerning, you know, modeling out reality. Right. Well, what, what, what is an attorney's job in cross-examination? It's to prove deception, because if you get a witness to basically admit that they lied on the stand, well, then the rest of their testimony, even if it's true, is thrown out. In terms of the jury's mind, they go, "This guy's a liar. I can't, I can't believe anything that he's had to say." Well, when it comes to the CDC and the FDA and the FBI and the CIA and Anthony Fauci, <laughs> and the list goes on and on and on. Why are you still listening to their testimony, Christopher Ray? Why? I just, I don't, I don't understand. Kim Cheadle? Why? The head of the Secret Service? Like, so that's that's my that's my operating, uh, you know. But that's my I, modus operandi. I think people are just starving for hope. And if they can see just a glimmer of hope in just one person to come down the stairs and, and save them. Right. They'll cling to that because you mean a golden they elevator? don't have to do anything. Right. You, you mean a, a golden escalator? <laughs> golden escalator. Exactly. Is that, is, is that the hope that they're clinging on to? Yeah. Look, I, I, I'm guilty of it myself. Like, even though I, I was actively running to try and defeat Donald Trump, I'm still hopeful that the guy is better than he was in his first term. Like, I think that we're, like it's very human to want to have hope in, in people, um, despite the fact that I, I was probably one of his most loud detractors because of what transpired during 2020. But like, then you see what's happening under the, the you know Democrat regime, and you're like, oh, well, this is disastrous. So where's the American public going to turn? Almost certainly they're going to turn back to Donald Trump. And am I to be totally hopeless in that endeavor? Yeah, probably. I probably ought to be rationally. Um, but I don't know. It, you're right. It is just a desire to have hope. Yeah. I mean, there's a few white pills that comes with, with Trump. I mean, he did speak uh, very fondly on ending the war in Ukraine, whether he can or not is yep. besides the point, the fact that we actually got something out of them to suggest so. But then, you know, is it just simply a ploy to move the theater of war from Ukraine to the Middle East or to China or something like that? So you could be jumping from, you know, the frying pan into the fire. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, in this case, it would be the, the fryer into the frying pan. There is nothing more dangerous than this proxy war with Russia. It is the two largest nuclear powers, you know, uh, a hair away from actually going hot with one another. It's crazy. But the uh, <laughs> the frying pan of Iran is a big, big deal. Like that's super dangerous, as you would probably guess. As a libertarian, I'm extraordinarily non-interventionist, and I think that all of these wars are misguided, and they are ultimately to to the benefit of uh, you know moneyed interests at the to the detriment of the American people and to the people of the world. Uh, I think that they've been disastrous. But yeah, this is this is the the constant you know coin flip thing that you get with Donald Trump where he gives this these incredible speeches some of the best speeches he's had over the past year have him him you know testifying essentially to like the CNN town hall going 
I just want people to stop dying. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a human response. Like, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And then you remember, it was Donald Trump who bragged that he had started to send munitions to Ukraine in the lead up to the, to the hot you know, proxy war with Russia. When he, when he bragged that Obama would only send pillows and blankets, but I sent them bombs. <laughs> it's like, dude, that's not a good idea. You're sending bombs to the neighbor of Russia as you're simultaneously you know, telling the American public that we ought to have better relations with Vladimir Putin. Why in God's name would you be arming their neighbor? Well, it's because of the Russia collusion narrative that was planted by the FBI, which sp- spied on you in the lead up to, the, to your election. And then... They cooed you with that, and then they tried to throw you out of power. And then at, as you're running for re-election, you talk about building the FBI a brand new building, the same institution oh, which no. spied on you after lying to the FISA court. You are the weirdest human being on the planet. That's basically my assessment of Donald Trump. Every institution that, that betrayed him betrayed the American public, and yet he is not as angry at them as, as we are, or as I am. I won't speak for you. Uh, it's very strange. Just, he's just a total mystery to me. Here's the thing, Clint, like if either one of us somehow made it into the Oval Office, like if you became president, I mean, God forbid you have. Yeah. Wouldn't you have the same kind of parameters, shackles on you as as he would have as well? So it's like, you know, the the system, the deep state, the system, whatever you want to call it, the bureaucratic state, it's just way too big. It's too influential. It's just its tentacles are everywhere. So it's like even if like I became president or you became president, What's really the extent of like what someone with really good intentions can do? Well, as for what the extent of our capacity in that role would be, I ha- I can't say definitively. I don't know because I don't know that Donald Trump is actually trying. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, I, I think it's very limited, but I think that the the one thing that you can't stop the president from doing, at least not without extraordinary uh, measures, is telling the truth. It's very hard to like, and that's what I do professionally. So if you put me in that role, I would be a real problem <laughs> because, because whether or not you stop me in what I was attempting to do, which would be abolish the CIA and the FDA and the FBI and the federal reserve and the military industrial complex and bring all of our troops home and go to sound money. Yeah, I would do a lot. So they could probably stop me from doing basically all of that, but they couldn't stop me from telling the American public that, hey, I'm trying to do this and you elected me to do this and they are stopping me at every turn. And here's the people that are stopping me. And if you want them to stop, you have to vote them out. Like that's I that's the angle I would take with it and just, you know, see if I could survive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go macro for a bit. What is kind of like your broad view of the entire world right now? And then we can kind of hone in a little bit more. You know, what should people have their eyes on? What should be on the the radar screen front and center for the average person right now? Yeah, I think that the most uh, probably poignant thing I could talk about right now is that I think that there's a major major transition from the war in Ukraine to uh, a buildup for a war against Iran. And I say that because it looks like Donald Trump is probably going to get the White House back and his selection for vice presidency, J.D. Vance, he comes out basically the first speech after he gets the nod and he's talking about you know the danger of Iran. And he's also been very good on the war in Ukraine and trying to get us away from that. So it tells me that there is a pivot coming and that particularly when you have Zelensky, who's also reading the tea leaves that you and I are, and he's saying to himself, oh, well, the gravy train from the American taxpayer is ending. I'm going to have to actually go to the negotiating table and try and end this thing after two years of my people just being devastated. So I hope that's what happens. I hope that that war ends. My, my concern is that, as, as is always the, uh, the case with the duopoly, it's like, well, sure, you get us out of the Democrat war in, in Ukraine or against Russia, and now you have the GOP who is advocating for war against Iran. Then you have this narrative that's dropped right after the attempt on Donald Trump's life where they're claiming that there's, I mean, Secret Service and the FBI and DHS all knew that there was extraordinary threats against Donald Trump. From from the kid who actually took a shot at him? No. From the Iranians. <laughs> what, what intel do we have to believe that? Nothing. Just take our word for it. Take the word they, of the institution that yeah, just but then they concluded that there was no connection between the two. Like, oh, I know they're trying to assassinate, him, but there's really no connection between. We just thought you should know. 
Yeah. Just in case, just in case, because that, that attempt failed, if there's another one, I just want you to know that it's not us. It's the Iranians. Uh, look, I am, as you guys, as you can tell from my tone, I'm a little skeptical <laughs> of what they have to say. So I think that's what the American public needs to be privy to is that it looks to me as if they are, they have given up on the war against Russia or the proxy war against Russia because they realize that it's going to be unwinnable, probably uh, civilization ending. So they're, they're hopefully walking away from that, which is good, by the way. I'm not upset about that. And then I think that they're going to shift and try and, you know, topple Iran, which they've been talking about my entire adult life. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a matter of, um, you know, resources are finite. All, all of these, you know, mi military arsenal yep. supplies that we've been sending over to Ukraine, um, we can't just keep doing that forever. And if the group that's behind Trump uh, wants to push for a war with Iran, then seemingly, you know, you've got to you've got to give and take. Right. You might have to end the Ukraine war so you can uh, offshore those resources. Yep. And relocate them somewhere else in the Middle East instead. It's the same thing that happened with the end of the Afghanistan we, war. Exactly. Yeah. That's what happened. The, the, there was a, only a couple month gap between the two. They knew. They knew what was happening. They knew that the there was chatter that Putin was going to move on Ukraine. Yeah. It's only he knew one about step the Maidan revolution and the constant constant years of undermining the relationship between them. The constant attempts to add Ukraine into NATO against the will of their very very nuclear armed neighbor. They knew everything that was transpiring, and I don't think there's any coincidence that a 20-year war finally, coincidentally, ends just as we enter, uh, you know, the largest and most dangerous proxy war in my lifetime. But I could be wrong. Right. What do you think about the um, the third choice? He's not a libertarian, but you know, maybe libertarian. RFK. Yeah, RFK. What do you think of him? Again, another very mysterious case. Um, I love love when he talks about what happened with his father and his and his uncle. I mean, amazing. Uh, it sounds as if he's genuinely telling the truth about what happened there. Um, I love the fact that he talks about medical freedom and and so much of you know he wrote a book, a fantastic book, which I read about Anthony Fauci. So I'm a I'm a big fan of of what he has to say, and I and I wish him both safety and success in reaching the American public with that message. But he's also very bad on the war <laughs> against the Palestinians, uh, or I should say the war between you know Israel and Palestine. So I, I don't understand how he is so good at explaining what led up to the Russia-Ukraine war, but he can't, he can't bring himself to acknowledge that the Palestinians have lived under terrible circumstances for decades and that this is kind of the natural outcome of that of that paradigm like but you you can say i mean he can do it eloquently so beautifully when it comes to the uh russia ukraine war but on this one he says that the palestinians are the most pampered people on the planet it's like how how are you how are you coming to that conclusion you know personally i think that he's compromised and i know that sounds very harsh but i just as someone who actually has like read some of the most cutting edge books when it comes to both conflicts, I don't know how you can be great on one and have no idea what's happening on the other and just be totally biased 100% for one side. Uh, it's weird. So I'm glad that he's in the campaign. I wish him safety and success, uh, but I also don't trust the guy. And I know that's kind of harsh, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think when you look at the elite class, you know, you can really, from a low resolution perspective, you can kind of divvy them up into two groups. You've got the neocons and the jingoists, like the nationalist type. And then you've got like the, the globalists out of Davos. Yep. And the Ukraine war is kind of like the, the globalists project. And then the jingoists or the neocons, you know, their big thing is the Middle East. Iran. Yep. Yeah. And so like in terms of factions, like how do you kind of view like what's kind of like your model for um, uh, the, the elite class there? Like, how do you kind of see it? I, I think that's right. I think that you're, you nailed it. Um, you know, from my vantage point, like I, I perceive my allies to be the genuine anti-war left, which is very small at this point, and the America first, uh, you know, Republicans, conservatives, the MAGA movement broadly, most of them have witnessed the war on terror and the financial, you know, degradation that came with it, not to mention the psychological destruction of their, their kids or themselves, because most of them are, you know, my age now, they're 40 years old and they're 
they live through all the, the lies and deception and propaganda and death and suicides and everything else. Like they realize it was a total, total waste, just a, a unbelievable waste, all predicated off of lies. So I see in those people and in the handful of lefties who are genuinely against war, I don't know why it's so hard for the broader Democrat movement to actually oppose war, but I can't get them to do it anymore. So I, I have way more allies um, on the right wing at this point, but I'm, I'm hopeful in that regard because the America First movement seems to genuinely want to stop getting involved in the business of everybody else's business all over the world. Uh, so, sorry, I, that wasn't really the question you asked, but I agreed with you, so I tangented into who I see as my allies. Are you in the market for gold and silver? Then if so, please consider Miles Franklin. They are my gold and silver dealer of choice. So, not only do they have super competitive prices that you're going to have a really hard time finding elsewhere, but then they also have top-notch customer support. I know Andy Schechtman, the owner of Miles Franklin, top-notch guy. I wouldn't be recommending them to you if I didn't have faith in their product. But what, what you really want to do, however, you want to email them at info at milesfranklin.com and you want to say that Capital Cosm sent me in the description line because when you do that, you can get access to their special pricing sheet. You want to get that special pricing sheet because you're going to get special prices that you won't find on the website itself. So email them at info at milesfranklin.com Tell them that Capital Cosm sent you and you won't be heckled with spam emails, etc. There's no commitment necessary. I promise you that. And with that said, I will let you get back to the video. Yeah. Yeah. So if I was like an elite class and I wanted to um, get the spotlight off myself, I'd create all these culture wars and then create big divisions off of these culture wars and uh, just get the people fighting amongst themselves. It's, it's like the, it's the black ant versus the, white, uh, the, the red ant. Um, uh, and analogy when you've got, you know, you've got ants in a, in a little ant farm and you shake it up and then all of a sudden they don't know what happened, but the, the black ant and the red ant start fighting because they think, oh, yeah. They, yeah. So it's like, it's the same thing. So, you know, I, but I by and large see these culture war points as kind of like red meat thrown out into the public. Is Do you, do you kind of see it that way as well? Because the, the key points that really matter, and I, I'm, I'm, Kind of in a similar camp with you. I'm with you in terms of the anti-war left, which I agree is far and few in between now, and the America First, um, you know, uh, Republicans or mm -hmm. conservatives um, that truly want to just make you know bring bring all of that energy and resource into making America um, uh, uplifting America as opposed to all of these projects overseas that right. don't really that that always end up you know, biting us in, in the rear end, you know, kind of like Ron Paul alluded to back in the day. I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, he was, Ron Paul was really the guy that got me into, you know, a lot of this stuff and a lot of, uh, into this, um, you know, libertarian philosophy and, and these well, sorts the, of things. And, then you are my people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as libertarians always say, Ron Paul was right. And, 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 about and basically everything. Yeah. And when Ron Paul was, um, you know, back in his heyday, back when he was still in Congress, he made alliances with Dennis Kucinich. And various yep. other Democrats, Cynthia McKinney. The, the, the handful of good leftists, yep. Yeah. No, I know. I, I, Yeah, I mean, Ron is my inspiration, too. I actually got to have him on my show for the first time two weeks ago. I had met him at an anti-war rally in, uh, in D.C. last January, uh, or 23 January, and it was, I mean, incredible. I got to have a photo uh, on the Capitol with the, that, the Capitol water behind us. It was like... It's the most legendary photo I've ever taken. But anyway, setting that aside, um, yeah, I think Ron's right. As for the culture war, I used to, you know, as a libertarian, I'm very much like live and let live. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to agree with your your lifestyle, but at the same time, I don't want it criminalized. Where I started to change my perspective on that is is be actually com comes from my my finance background, and that that'll probably surprise people. So let me explain. What I realized as a as a money manager and as a investment professional was that there was a lot of investing that was going on that I didn't understand. There was a lot of advertising that was going on that I didn't understand. I did, it, it seemed totally against the incentive of the fiduciary for those assets that you would actually be pushing, you know, hyper progressive agendas through your advertising campaign as you're trying to reach a very broad audience and get as many people as 
possible to buy your products. I mean, the most famous example at this point is Dylan Mulvaney and the Bud Light fiasco, but it started years before that. What put it on my radar was like 2016 or something or thereabouts where it was Gillette talking about how men and masculinity were a problem. And I was like, the best a man can get? I was like, the, the, the company who just did nothing but tell me how good I was for being a man my entire lifetime, and now you're telling me I'm bad for being a man? This is crazy. So I started to do the research because I was a fiduciary myself. I was managing you know crazy amounts of money, and I was like, I need to be very safe with my investor's capital. As a fiduciary, I understand you don't ever... As a CEO for a company, you don't ever run an ad campaign that insults your base. That's crazy. Why would you possibly do that? You're trying to grow your base, not destroy it. And then I finally figured it out. About 2021, as I'm doing you know, Liberty Lockdown, I, I have more time to, to actually do research on this stuff because I've shut down my mortgage company. And I discover ESG. I discover environmental, mm -hmm. social, and governance. I realized that the United Nations had this plot from decades prior that was going to address climate change, but ultimately it meant that they were going to address all of the injustice all over the world. And then I discovered DEI, and then I realized that Barack Obama actually mandated it through executive order in 2012. And he required that all federal departments across the United States government had to have a DEI department. And then I realized that any capital that they deploy to private contractors also has to basically qualify under the DEA, DEI framework, which uh, allowed for essentially the culture war to go from the public sector into the private sector. And that then the capital that was tied to BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard to the tune of trillions also went along with this because they had met with the powers that be at the World Economic Forum. And they had all decided that this is the way that we, re we reimagine the world in our image. And, and we can actually do so without the American public or the people of the world having any idea what happened. And I was like, oh, I get it now. Like, this is a plot against the people. The culture war is real. Yes, I still am a live and let live guy. But I now understand that the incentive structure by which this caught on fire is not organic. And I think that's the, the key takeaway that I had and what I wanted to express to your audience, because I think it's really important that people get that. Yeah. So, so why do you think they are pushing this kind of like unisex message like every like yeah. it seems like they're just trying to make everyone's indistinguishable blobs where we're all kind of homogenous nothing really matters our gender doesn't really exist you can just be whatever you want you know being a woman is just akin to wearing a dress it's just a right. costume um what why why are they you know why would they do something like that what's the purpose it, well i mean for some of them the the true believers are are malthusian at the end of the day they believe that the the planet is overpopulated and they really don't want people to be reproducing. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. There are, there are tons of those people that are involved in this that genuinely believe that, that have bought totally into the, uh, you know, carbon dioxide theses that, that human existence will ultimately be the destruction of human existence and that therefore we have to decrease the amount of people that are on the planet. That's what they believe. And I, like, they're not BSing. They genuinely believe it. They are scared to death. So I think that's a big part of this is that a lot of people that have been pushing this kind of sexual progressive agenda, well, it also happens to you know, coincide with the fact that, yeah, gay dudes, they don't get to have kids. Sure, they can adopt, but they don't make more people. And that's the key is that they don't want people making more people. Uh, we can go a lot deeper with this, but I don't want you to lose your channel. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> I, I appreciate it, man. <laughs> I must admit, I was aloof to your financial background. So uh, now knowing that you actually have a financial background, I'm kind of interested. What kind of like your take on the economy and the um, the, the financial world at the moment? Sure, uh, I'm I'm convinced that we we should have had a very severe depression after the 08 collapse, and instead, you know, there was the TARP program, 800 billion that was. That now sounds quaint <laughs> compared to the payouts that happened during lockdowns. But at the time, I was a young professional, and it was the most crazy thing I had ever heard. $800 billion. What are we even talking about? This is nuts. Uh, so, yeah, now we do trillions. Now we do packages of trillions multiple times per year. It's stupid. It's crazy. It's suicidal. We are absolutely destroying ourselves economically. Um, but anyways, <laughs> because of the Federal Reserve and because of the capacity to borrow and print and spend, uh, they they delayed that day of reckoning in a major way. 
and and because of that they buried the damage that happened because of the derivatives markets that were created in the lead up to the the bubble of 05 through 07 and the collapse in 08 and 09 which is when I came out of college right into the teeth of it and I was responsible for liquidating foreclosures in my family's mortgage company and it was awful later I branch out and I start my own company and I have a much better life but the first few years of my career were terrible so Long story short, I, del- I believe that they essentially put a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, which was a Band-Aid on a bullet wound from, you know, savings alone and, and getting off of, uh, you know, the gold standard and everything else. I mean, n- none of this is ever getting to like the holistic fix, which is actually sound money, as you would imagine as a libertarian, I would believe that. But I think that we're now facing $35 trillion dollars of national debt or thereabouts. It's very close, not to mention the unfunded liabilities, which are the tune of hundreds of trillions of dollars by some estimates. So we're screwed. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're economically, we're totally screwed. And most people have no idea. They have no idea how dangerous this is, that in fact, the largest expenditure of the United States government over the next 12 months will be the interest, not the, not the principal, not paying down anything, but the interest on the national debt, well over a trillion dollars which is an astronomical sum of money, which most people can't even like actually imagine what I'm talking about right now. That's how big a sum of money is that you don't even know how to like actually think about it. That will just be lit on fire in debt interest that you're going to pay just to keep us out of bankruptcy. That's, that's where we're at. We are, we are the end stage empire. And you know, as a libertarian who hated our, our warmongering ways, I'm happy that we're end stage empire. But as an American who loves his country and very much wants to have financial success for his people, I am horrified or mortified of what what the future holds economically. So, yeah, uh, Bitcoin and gold, ladies and gentlemen, that's where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you look at a debt to GDP ratios at 120 percent. The the benchmark rate for when a sovereign debt collapse occurs typically throughout history is at around 90 to 100 percent. So we're already in uncharted territory, so to speak. And then all it really takes is, um, you know, for the world to stop buying our new debt to finance our bad debt. I mean, that's another thing that people tend to. I think a lot of um, experts throughout the years over the last decade or so who were expecting like a big sovereign debt crisis and never really saw it materialize. You, they they tended to look at the the big fifteen trillion, twenty trillion, twenty five trillion, thirty trillion dollar number on the sovereign debt. But as long as the world kept buying our new debt to finance that old debt, of course, this system stays in place, right? Yes. Well, th- this is this has been my critique and I've gotten a lot of flack for it because I'm critiquing some of our heroes or, or some of, I'm speaking as a libertarian, um, you know, at a, uh, Peter Schiff, he, he's been very famous for these warnings about, about the debt and how it's basically an addiction and you got to get off of it. And I agree with him on all that. But I think that he and so many others got the timing wrong because they weren't giving enough credence to the fact that this is the reserve currency of the world, that you can actually behave in a totally psychotic fashion as, as the overlords of the United States because so much of the demand for what you are printing out of thin air exists all over the planet. So like that, that creates... Well, you can you can boost supply a ton if demand is that extraordinary, but and here's the problem: we decided to pull the financial nuclear weapons out on Russia, and the rest of the world did not ignore it. They know exactly what happened. They know that they there was immense provocations against the Russian people in the lead up to that war, including the bombing of their people in the Donbas region, and but it doesn't matter. Because the the United States State Department had decided that we were going to have a war against Russia, so they just they just lied to the people of the world, and they said they have no legitimate grievances and they have no claims on Ukraine, and they ought to be added into NATO, despite the fact that we promised the Russians that we would never expand past uh, Germany. But we were, you know we're we're over a thousand miles and twenty plus nations uh, added into NATO, and if they do anything to Ukraine as a response of that. It, it's not our fault. There's no provocations coming from us. Are you crazy? It's just this tyrant Putin who's modern day Hitler and he's going to take over the rest of Europe. It's all it's all such an unbelievable lie. Anyways, what was the original question? I got totally on a <laughs> sidetrack, no, no, but no, I no. did have something to say. No, no, I was just making a point that the that 
oftentimes you'd see these experts throughout the years who would call for a sovereign debt crash just because they seem okay. like a, just because they see a huge number on the screen, right? Yes. But the problem was the world was still buying our debt. Yes. So as long as that keeps that Ponzi scheme keeps occurring, the, the we could have a hundred trillion dollars in sovereign debt and right. nothing would crash as long well, as that. Yeah. The, theoretically, I mean, there is there is a threshold at which like there's just not enough money, on, right. even uh, even in the rest of the world, for them to actually buy up the United States debt. But the the reason I went on that massive tangent is that the the problem is that after Putin invaded uh, Ukraine, I think it was February of twenty one or twenty two, whatever it was, they kicked the Russians off of SWIFT, which is the you know uh, international trading lanes for uh, settling dealings and it was like big big deal huge deal and most people of the world have no idea what i'm talking about it's a big big deal though because the only way that you you maintain your status as the reserve currency of the world is to treat other countries fairly <laughs> you actually have to not be a psychopath and a tyrant because otherwise they will they have their own you know free will like they can actually decide to not use us dollars so you kick rush off of swift and then on top of that they stole Three hundred billion dollars from the central banks that were storing their their assets in European banks. I mean, it's unbelievable. So, what is the rest of the world to do? All of these other central bankers and all of these other you know leaders of nations that are looking around saying, "Oh, whoa!" Like, if we have a a issue with our neighbor that is is brought about because of a catalyst that comes from the American government, and we respond to it, the American government will then steal our central bank assets and they will kick us off of the international trading you know lanes like, this is nuts so what are they doing they're all now banding together into the BRICS alliance and they're saying we're going to create a competitor to you guys because you're totally psychotic and they're right and that's the sad thing is that the u.s dollar reserve status could have been maintained for decades more than it than it than it otherwise will be but the uh, the military industrial complex in the United States State Department could not control themselves, and therefore our financial demise is far more imminent than it would otherwise have been. Yeah, the rule of law is a big reason why capital just floods into the United States because, yep. unlike many other places, you can rest assured that your capital is safe here because we are ruled by laws, not men. Um, up until about two or three years ago, that is no longer the case. And much to your point there, Clint. You know, you look at this BRICS alliance, you know, they were formed sometime in the early 2010s, but they went radio silent for five, six, seven, eight years. Like we hadn't heard of BRICS in a long, long time. Yep. I remember reading a tweet um, three or four years ago. This was before the Ukraine war. And uh, someone was like jokingly making a remark about like, oh, do you remember that BRICS alliance? <laughs> Whatever happened to that? Well, fast forward a couple of years, Ukraine war popped off and now it's right back, right back front and center. Because there's a there's a there's a need for a second world order, so to speak. To yeah, but but the the tragic part of it is like the only reason these nations decided to go down that path is because the United States was trying to defend that world order. But but the way they tried to defend it was by toppling Gaddafi in Libya and toppling Saddam in Iraq and going after Assad in Syria and. Basically, any leader that that ever signaled that he was actually going to be acting on behalf of his people financially, they did a lot of terrible stuff for their people otherwise. But in terms of like financial interests, yeah, you ought to have autonomy. You ought to try and act as a sovereign. Like, I'm I don't I'm kind of anarchist leaning, but at the same time, like, if you're going to have a leader of a nation, you would like them to be interested in protecting the financial interests of their people, right? That would be nice. Well, if you do that, you will actually perish <laughs> like that's that's basically the track record of foreign uh you know leaders who who try and pretend as if they're big boys or as if they're pinocchio <laughs> without the strings and the united states state department and the cia goes no you're not um so i think that's what happened i honestly do and you know this is after reading and talking to my buddy scott horton who i think is the greatest uh you know modern you know anti-war historian and I've also read all of his books and they're unbelievable deep dives that take quotes of these people in their own words. I know a lot of what I'm saying will probably land on your audience is totally psychotic. Like they'll think that I'm totally out, out to lunch. But if you go and you read these people's quotes, if you read what Netanyahu had to say about controlling the height of the flame when it came to Hamas and how that was actually their intention, um, 
this is undeniable stuff. I mean, it, <laughs> like that actually happened. It, it was his, uh, you know, the, the Likud party that that had planned these things. And then same same thing with the Russia Ukraine war. You had Condoleezza Rice and the current CIA director, former uh, U.S. ambassador to Russia, who's in these leaked cables from WikiLeaks, where he admits that like this is the ultimate red line. You cannot add Ukraine to NATO. Russia does not want to have to respond. He's very explicit about this to Condoleezza Rice in like 2011. And he said, they don't want to have to deal with this. But if you if you continue to push them to be added to NATO, it will force their hand. And they just I just want to really emphasize they don't want to do this. Like that's their whole takeaway. And then what did they do anyways? Despite the fact that they knew that they could not do this, they did it anyways. And what does that tell you? It tells you that they wanted this to happen. And so many of our, our wars in my lifetime are this exact story. Everyone knows about the lies and deception that went into the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Almost nobody knows about the deception that led into the war against, or the proxy war against Russia, and how unbelievably dangerous and psychotic it is. Um, sorry for the tangent and rant. No, I'm, no, I'm, I mean, I'm it, very activated today. <laughs> no, it, I mean, it, it goes back to, to our initial point, right? People just aren't paying attention. You know, yes. they, people can criticize, oh, well, we shouldn't have gone to Afghanistan, we shouldn't have gone to Iraq to begin with. But then a new war pops up in Ukraine. A new war is about to pop off in the Middle East, and now all of a sudden they're still they're gung ho. They're right back to where they started. It's like, are you guys not paying attention to, to yes. history? <laughs> like, this is the on. question. You, this is the question you asked me. You know, twenty minutes ago, what would be your advice to have people not get tricked? And it's like, just remember, just remember yeah, what they did yeah. to you last time. But I'm. This is the this is the reality is that a lot of people cannot extrapolate information. That they've learned from the past into new experiences like they they just can't do it and they, and they just get swept up in the moment um there's a book called um the psychology of crowds i don't know if you've heard of it by yep. uh, gustav and he basically talks about like how it, people fall into mass hysteria really quickly but then they fall out of it really slowly it's little yes. by little yes. right so it's easy to get swept up like hindsight is 2020 20. like you can see the fallacies behind the, the iraq war etc but when you're actually in the moment and you're engulfed in the hype, then most people are just going to buy into the hype. Right. I remember, you know, during the height, you know, the, during the very beginning of the Ukraine war, for example, um, a lot of the GOP, the conservative wing, um, they were all on board with the war in Ukraine. You're and right. then they slowly started to unwind up to the point. Now we've got like the VP and the, and the presidential nominee, both speaking against it. So, yep. you know, much to your point, you know, people are just emotional. Emotions have emotions always occur before logic. There's a, there's a lag between emotion and reason. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, that <laughs> that gap is very significant for yeah. a lot of people. Like, um, yeah, I mean, you're right. It it is it is hopeful in the sense that that people do wake up and they do realize that they've been lied to. Um, it's also extraordinarily disheartening to realize that they're almost certainly going to fall for the next psychological yeah. operation. Like, I think that. The good news or like the more hopeful outlook on this is to say that, okay, you've got X amount of people that are going to realize through rational analysis that they've been lied to. Well, 10% of those people are going to never be tricked again. And every time there's a new event, 10% of those people will never be tricked right. again. And eventually you have enough people who are genuinely critical thinking and, and extrapolating prior experiences into the present, and they will not be fooled. Um, we need you guys. <laughs> so yeah. please, please do it. You know, Say what you will about Elon Musk, but um, I think with yeah. X being the way it is now, I think any sort of PSYOP, is like being debunked in record time now. Like any type agree more, of, man. you know, shenanigans that any power player can play, um, it's going to get debunked in X within less than a week from now oh, on. Unless days, yeah. I mean, days. if I, if you saw, they were they were running, you know, Kamala Harris, uh, geographies. They were rewriting her history in real time. Mm. You know, yeah. saying she she didn't do this. She wasn't the border czar. Yeah, and then you hard. have Joe Biden on tape saying that's why I made Kamala the border czar. Yeah, they can't and get away with the old with the old shenanigans. Yeah, man. And this was this was hours, if not minutes, from them trying to rewrite this narrative. So yeah, it's it's making their jobs a lot harder. But this is the reason that they I think they've been pressuring uh, not just Elon but all of the social media companies so aggressively 
And that was actually probably the worst ruling from the Supreme Court over the past year was when they came down saying uh, that wasn't unconstitutional. When they pressured every social media company to censor the American public, not unconstitutional. How? How is that not unconstitutional? Uh, but anyways, that's another rabbit hole. Yeah, for sure. So, Clint, what I've been doing the last several episodes is um, I've been opening the floor for my guests to ask a question to my next guest. So, uh, if there's a, Yeah, so if there's a question you'd like to ask my next guest, what would it be? Oh, man. Whether they're a Trump supporter or a hater, I would like to hear from them. Why? What do they expect from a second Donald Trump term? And uh, and does he su survive to serve it? Because <laughs> that'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a big question about that. Um, so my question to you from my last guest, Todd, Todd Horowitz, he wants to know. Uh, my your next guest, I'd like to know what they think of the overall uh, United States of America. And are we still the greatest nation in the world? Yes. Uh, largely because of our foundational documents and and the the fabric of kind of the american cultural ethos i think is extraordinarily unique and special and should be cherished and upheld and and preserved um unfortunately it is i'm not even sure that the majority of people that live in america actually know what i'm talking about or value the same things that i'm talking about but what i'm specifically talking about are kind of the bill of rights property rights capacity to defend yourself the ability to speak freely um adding not intervention and all these other libertarian tropes, but just the, just the bare bones of the bill of rights. Like that's a unbelievably glorious document, even from a libertarian who doesn't really believe in the authority of the government. I still read that thing. And I go, these, are, these were written by beautiful, brilliant human beings. And we ought to appreciate their efforts and their risks and their, and what they endeavored upon. And we ought to cherish and defend it. So yes, America is the greatest country on the world. And cool. yes, it's also deeply, deeply in trouble yeah yeah very well put um i'm also going to ask you what book or books you'd recommend the audience look into to i typically ask them to recommend books to become a better investor you, i mean you can still recommend a book or two like that but in general i mean because I, I know this this topic was pretty broad but in general what books do you recommend people should look into uh well i'll i'll recommend my guy uh bitcoin standard safedine um Big fan of that guy and his work, uh, obviously. And the Fed, Ron Paul. You just read anything by Ron Paul. Read anything from my guy Scott Horton. Read anything from my guy Tom Woods. Uh, you know, I've I've become friends with all the all of my heroes over the past few years that I've become a podcaster. It's very surreal. Um, but that you know, I was a fan of theirs because they wrote incredible books that that taught me and and made me who I am. So, highly recommend. Um, Scott Horton's latest, which comes out later this year, I got to read the pre-release last year. It's called Provoked, which is this entire history, which is what I was talking about with the war between Russia and Ukraine. I think for people to understand that one in depth, it'll 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 red pull them in a way that is lasting, that they will not fall for the next psychological operation. I think that's the the real key here. So I'll I'll end with that. The Scott Horton's book Provoked. Pre-order it now. I don't know if it's even able to be pre-ordered, but keep an eye out for it. Cool. Well, we'll try and get the links to all those in the in the uh, description down below, awesome. Uh, Clint. Awesome. Well, tell us where we can find you. Drop us your socials, Clint. Any, in any uh, concluding thoughts before we wrap up? Anything you want to talk about that we didn't get a chance to get to? Yeah, I'll just say, you know, as a, a real estate guy, um, you know, my, my concern is that the hiked interest rate cycle it has been, is very long in the tooth. And it's been, I mean, from the zero bound up to five plus percent is very dramatic and the, the pace at which they did it was historic or at least in my lifetime historic i think that there is major damage that has been done to the balance sheets of the banking institutions uh, because they had bought long-term debt as you know you buy it and then you know you basically you take a loss because of what the federal reserves actions were after you purchased it at par now you're sitting on you know billions of dollars worth of losses it was then papered over and covered up through uh the BTFP, the bank term funding program of a little over a year ago, where you had all those banks that were blowing up. Anyways, long story short, I think there's a lot of damage that has been done to the banking institutions and to the debt markets that, that the American public isn't privy to. I also think that there's the inventory of housing has been held artificially low, both through regulatory environment and also through um, 
you know, the interest rate and money manipulation that's been transpiring my entire adult life, which sucks. But I think that there's a real reason to be concerned about the real estate market. Uh, I can't, I won't, I won't go out on a limb and give people timing, but I am seeing inventory skyrocket over the past few months. And I think that people ought to continue to look at those figures and make sure that they don't get caught holding the bag because, uh, you know, maybe I'm just traumatized by what I experienced coming out of college into the 0809 <laughs> arena. But, uh, I think people ought to be privy that that is not a one-off that it is totally possible that that could happen again and worse because of the amount of debt. Uh, the other thing people forget is that we only had like, I forget 20 trillion or something. And now we're up to 35 trillion from the last recession. Like, so the, the pain will be exponentially more and, uh, and I'm nervous about that. So yeah, like I started off with my earlier rent, Bitcoin and <laughs> Bitcoin, gold, silver, you know, uh, anyways, at Liberty Lockpot on X, if people want to follow me, got 150 some thousand of you guys over there. I appreciate you. And, uh, Liberty Lockdown, YouTube, everywhere else. And I also do the best political show over on We Are Change with Luke Radowski. Uh, it is, we, we have an exclusive deal with Rumble, so people can watch us there. We just had uh, Russell Brand on last week, which is, was a real treat. So life is, life is uh, evolving rapidly. And I also do a comedy show called Tower Gang, which you should never, ever watch. Thank you for, thank you for having me, man. Yeah, cool, man. Well, we'll get all those links down below. Check out, uh, check out all those, all that stuff, guys. Follow Clint Russell. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on, Clint. If you guys enjoyed this video, type "Go Clint Go" in the comment section. <laughs> go Clint Go. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video. Comment down below if you agree or disagree with any of our takes. Really interested to get your thoughts there, and I will catch you in the next episode. Bye, guys.